Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leading Health Systems Network webinar series, this year focused on antimicrobial stewardship. Based at Imperial College and in partnership with the World Innovation Summit for Health, the Leading Health Systems Network, LHSN, is a collaborative network of healthcare leaders and organizations dedicated to improving healthcare delivery by effectively and efficiently using available resources. Our network brings together ideas, experiences, and expertise regarding models of care and strategies to drive sustained improvement, while also connecting healthcare leaders to a like-minded community of peers that share the same goals and challenges. My name is Mary Helen Pombo, and as a fellow at the Center for Health Policy at Imperial College London, I lead on the LHSN program. Today, I'm joined by our speaker, Karar Karar, who I have the pleasure of introducing. As a researcher at the Access to Medicine Foundation, Karar directly supports the work of the Access to Medicine Index and the Antimicrobial Resistance Benchmark. As a pharmacist by training, he holds a Master's of Pharmacy from Cardiff University and an MSc in International Health Policy from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he completed his dissertation on innovative and sustainable business models for pharmaceutical companies in resource-limited, low- and middle-income countries. Prior to joining the foundation, Karar has worked as a rotational clinical pharmacist covering different subspecialities of medicine in the British National Health Service. He completed his postgraduate qualifications in clinical pharmacy at Cardiff University. Today, Karar will be discussing the recent report re released by the Access to Medicine Foundation, which provides an analytical perspective on their recent benchmark of pharmaceutical company performance at addressing antimicrobial resistance. Our Twitter hashtag for this event is hashtag LHSN webinar. We invite you to interact with others listening to this webinar or to tweet messages you find of interest, again, by using hashtag LHSN webinar. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Karar. Um, first, I'd just like to thank Mary Helen uh, for giving us this wonderful opportunity to disseminate our work. We appreciate the network for reaching out to the foundation, um, and we're excited to kickstart this webinar series on antimicrobial stewardship research policies and practice. Um, as Mary Helen mentioned, my name is Kara Kara. Um, yep, and this is not a typo. My first name and surname are the same. Um, and I'll be presenting the antimicrobial resistance benchmark, which we launched in January 2018 of this year. So with this, this presentation, I'll aim to keep it within about 35 minutes or so, and then we'll do a QA question. Um, and hopefully the technology does not fail us. So I'm praying that you guys can all hear me. So just a brief outline of the presentation. I will just start by giving a background of our organization for those of you who are not familiar with our work. Um, then I will set the scene surrounding why it is that we're discussing the issue of antimicrobial resistance. I will then introduce the benchmark, and this includes the scopes for analysis. Um, I will then, within the remit of this presentation and the time constraints, I will stick to outlining the key findings of the report. I will then touch on the analysis. And then finally, um, I'll just give, show you guys an illustration of how companies perform the actual benchmark. Um, again, if there's any hiccups, if you guys just kind of alert me through the platform and then hopefully we can get those rectified. So the Access to Medicine Foundation, essentially, and uh, we're based in the Netherlands. And our mission is to stimulate and guide pharmaceutical companies to do more for people living in low and middle income country markets without access to medicine. We talk to experts about the actions pharmaceutical companies can and should be taking. And then essentially we analyze what it is they're actually doing. Um, so this means the analysis of companies' actions and policies regarding access to medicine. And to do this, we use a rigorous scoring and evaluation process. We then aim to benchmark companies against each other by identifying best practices and progress gaps. Uh, we then aim to make these publications uh, widely available. And then we use our findings and through some of our outreach activities we work to expand good practices across the industry. Um, here we've just uh, included some of the model of how it is we, we do what we do. So as I said, as a foundation, um, we've been aiming to change or to uh, enable change within the pharmaceutical industry within the last decade or so. And this is facilitated through a three-pronged approach. The first one essentially involves building stakeholder consensus. And as I said, this is where companies can and should be taking action with regards to access to medicine. And then every two years, this stakeholder consensus is then translated into clear metrics for measuring company behavior. Now, this goes to form our methodology. Now, the second component involves stimulating pharma companies to compete on priority health topics. Our research identifies best practice, as already mentioned. 
And by publicly recognizing companies' positive actions, we trigger comp other companies to join the race to do well. And this is essentially facilitated through the Sentinel effect, which basically says what gets measured gets done. And then the final component is we aim to share these best practices that we've highlighted. Um, and then this hopefully, uh, the aim of this is to the development of new approaches to longstanding barriers to access. So here I've just outlined the foundation's strategic goals. Um, and in essence, there are five pillars which we will strive to ensure form the foundations of how pharmaceutical industry operates in these resource limited settings. Now this touches on everything from embedding a pro-access governance approach, whereby we ensure access to medicine becomes a key pillar uh, with regards to the management structures within these companies. Other components include uh, mainstreaming inclusive business models. Now we know companies have traditionally struggled to access these markets. We do acknowledge that this requires some innovation surrounding established business models that have proved to be fruitful for these companies in mature high income country markets. Um, a study done by the American Management Association highlighted the 10% of innovation investment at global companies revolves around developing new business models. So again, this is no small feat and this is not limited to the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, other components include, for example, employing an access thinking approach to product deployment. Now this includes stuff like wide registration of products in a large number of countries scope, as well as ensuring that the pricing strategies adopted in these countries are equitable. So this is just a synopsis slide of a snapshot of our work. Now the first one uh, is basically what we've become to be renowned for, which is the Access to Medicine Foundation. Now this ranks the top 20 pharmaceutical companies globally uh, based on seven technical areas. And this ranges everything from R&D through to product de de uh, deployment, which basically involves pricing, manufacturing, and production, and distribution. Uh, and then stuff like patents and licensing, capacity building, product donations. We have the antimicrobial resistance benchmark, which I'll elaborate on further. Um, other publications include the Access to Vaccine Index. This was published in 2017 and essentially assessed eight companies um, on activities on how these guys are contributing to global immunization targets. Um, in between those publications then, we have thematic studies, which basically provide topic-specific analysis on a range of topics. And in the past, this has been done anything from cancer care through to hepatitis treatment. Now, the ultimate goal of our work collectively um, is to facilitate both internal change makers within these pharmaceutical companies, as well as organizations from private sector, donors and NGOs, as well as governments and investors. And this hopefully uh, will help guide strategy and policy discussions in the wider public sphere. So what's the reason that we're actually here today? What's, what's the, 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 the kind of situation that's resulted in antimicrobial resistance becoming so high in the global agenda? Um, now, AMR or antimicrobial resistance is increasingly seen as one of the biggest global health threats, um, which essentially threatens human health globally. It compromises food security and has the potential to undermine key development milestones, um, which have been achieved in the last half century or so. Now, the actual resistance occurs when microorganisms, such as bacteria, fungi, and virus, change on exposure to antimicrobial use, therefore making that original therapy redundant. Now, in terms of figures, uh, AMR is believed to cause around 700,000 deaths annually. This is believed to creep to about 10 million by 2050 if the rise in AMR goes unchecked. The global economic cost of such a rise um, in mortality and morbidity attributed to a rise in AMR is estimated to be around 100, 100 trillion um, US dollars. Now, this kind of alludes as to why the British government commissioned the macroeconomist Jim O'Neill to chair the UK AMR review as opposed to a health economist. Um, it's important to note uh, that when actually considering the AMR debate, that 10 times as many people die from a lack of access to antibiotics than resistance. Now, this is very important, and this is kind of evidenced by the fact that three of the top 10 uh, spots in the top 10 uh, causes of death by the WHO are due to infectious diseases. Um, also, you can see on there that actually within the last two decades, there's only been two new antibiotic classes introduced into the market. Now, we'll delve into as, as to why this is later. At the bottom here, you can just see some quotes, um, which basically suggest that the time for action is now. Now, this is reiterated by Professor Dame Sally Davis, who I believe will be speaking later on in this lecture series. Um, and this is reinforced by the former UK Prime Minister, Mr. David Cameron. So the global, antibi global antibiotic market, um, what are the issues there, basically? Um, where are we going wrong? And why have we failed to produce new antibiotics to replace those becoming redundant? Now, it appears that the antibiotic development pipeline is not accelerating at the needed rate, despite the, the numerous call for action. 
Now, this is believed to be due to a variety of constraints, which are unique to the antibiotic market, that make it financially unappealing to investors. Now, this has been uh, illustrated through divestments in the antibiotic space by many players over the years. Now, as you can see, are just some of the, the issues surrounding the antimicrobial market or the antibiotics market. So the first one is a strong generic competition. Now, health systems will always advocate the use of generic medicines, rationally due to cost issues over patented products. Um, this is captured by a global antibiotics market, which is worth 40 billion US dollars in terms of sales a year. Now, when you consider the sales attributed to patented products, this accounts for about 4.7 billion. Um, now, putting that into perspective in terms of other therapeutic areas, this is a figure that typically a leading oncology agent will bring in a year. Um, so when you actually consider that in terms of investments in antibiotics, you can understand why pharmaceutical companies are struggling to, to operate in this space. Um, the second component is a low demand. Typically, antibiotics are prescribed for one to two weeks. Um, now, these are very short courses. When you compare that to um, long-term chronic conditions, such as cardiovascular or diabetes, for example, these are typically prescribed lifelong. Now, this gives companies a chance to recoup mammoth investments. Um, again, less of a, makes, making antibiotics less financially viable. Now, we have technical and cost challenges surrounding development. Um, clinical, clinical trial design has proved to be a technical uh, challenge uh, for antibiotics. And this is simply due to the incremental benefit shown by antibiotics means that large numbers of uh, people would have to be recruited for clinical trials to actually show incremental benefit. Then we have the issue surrounding conservation efforts, which basically dictate that new antibiotics with new mechanisms of actions are typically left as last line. Um, now again, this perpetuates a cycle of lower demand and essentially makes a high volume, high return market not feasible. And the last component we've got is inadequate reimbursement systems. Um, now, basically, the, there have been many that called and say that the, the way in which antibiotics are reimbursed and priced um, are too low to spur innovation. Within the public health uh, arena, some have been calling for more value-based approach to pricing antibiotics. And this essentially aims to capture more of a societal impact um, in terms of the benefits of combating uh, infections. So, all this aside, um, what is the role of the industry? Um, while as developers and producers of antimicrobials, pharmaceutical companies must join the efforts to control AMR. Now, this can be seen through two key uh, milestone publications by the industry or commitments by the industry. The first of which was the Davos Declaration signed in January 2016. and essentially was signed by more than 100 pharmaceutical companies, associations, um, which involves pharmaceutical companies, biotech and diagnostic industries on combating AMR. The second follow-up of which was called the Industry Roadmap and essentially looked at the progress on combating antimicrobial resistance. Um, and this was signed by 13 companies, which all of whom were signatories to the original declaration. So this brings us on today's topic uh, in terms of the antimicrobial resistance benchmark. As I said, this was launched in January of 2018 in Davos. Um, and it's essentially the first independent report to systematically evaluate how a cross section of the pharmaceutical industry is combating AMR. Um, it's independently funded by the UK and Dutch government. The methodology report was made available in August of 2017. And as I've already mentioned, this report became fully available in January of this year. And this is just, again, reiterates the previous slides in terms of building consensus, tracking progress. In this particular case, the actual report focuses on three main domains. Now these are R&D, manufacturing production, and stewardship and access. And essentially, we aim to diffuse these practices both within companies, as well as the wider public health um, and as well as the other stakeholders, such as companies, governments, and investors. And this is just a snapshot of some of the dissemination strategy we've adopted, which involves everything from media outlets through to um, stakeholder engagement. Okay, so moving on to the actual um, reports company scopes. Um, now, the benchmark compares 30 companies, um, and these were selected based on their market presence, their expertise in developing critically needed antimicrobials, and their public commitment to tackling AMR. And I was, as I already mentioned, these commitments are the industry roadmap as well as the Davos Declaration. Now we acknowledge that the business models, sizes, portfolios of the different groups of the companies you can see here, um, give them different responsibilities and roles in regarding AMR. We have the eight largest or the eight large research-based pharmaceutical companies. They obviously have a prominent role in R&D, but they also have the power to ensure appropriate use of antibiotics whilst leveraging their geographic reach and supply and manufacturing chains. With regards to the generic um, manufacturers, they obviously have a similar role as well. 
However, due to, the high, due to the unique business model underpinned by high volume, low margin approach, um, these companies are key to the access debate, as well as becoming more and more increasingly important to the stewardship component. Um, and then with regards to the 12 biopharmaceutical companies in scope, um, these were selected as they were all developing at least one promising clinical R&D stage um, clinical candidate. Now moving on to research scopes, um, as I said, we essentially have tackled this benchmark using three main domains. Um, from the indicators, you may be able to see alignment with other public initiatives, such as the 10 fronts where action is needed, as highlighted by the UK AMR review. Um, and here, so with regards to R&D, essentially we wanted to look at the health of these pipelines. So how big are they uh, in terms of novelty? Um, and, and the latter component of the R&D chapter looked at essentially what companies are doing to facilitate access and stewardship in terms of planning for both of these early on before the drug actually reaches the market. With regards to manufacturing production, this predominantly revolved around the company's environmental risk management strategy, as well as how they produce antibiotics and how that complies with international regulations for quality, which is um, GMP or good um, manufacturing practice. Now, moving on to uh, access and stewardship, essentially this tackles the twin challenges of both ensuring access as well as stewardship. With regards to access, this touches on uh, everything from how and how widely companies register their antibiotics through to their pricing strategies, um, as well as some of the supply chain management strategies. Now, with regards to stewardship, this again touches on everything from AMR surveillance through to how companies remunerate sales staff in terms of promotional activities. So, as I said, within the remit of this presentation, I will stick to presenting the high level findings of the report. Now, the first of which um, revolves around the clinical or the R&D pipeline. So once a new antibiotic enters the market, um, AMR response strategies call for it to be used prudently. Now, this essentially slows the emergence of resistance and is aimed to maximize the lifespan. However, um, such stewardship activities must be uh, pursued alongside efforts to ensure appropriate access. Now, of the 175 antimicrobial medicines, targeting pathogens seen by the WHO and the Centers for Disease Control as the biggest AMR threats. 40 are in clinical development. 28 of those are antibiotics. But more importantly, of those 28, only two have both access and stewardship plans. Now, these are Evercycline um, and uh, Pediatric Bidacoline, produced by Tetraphase and Johnson & Johnson. In terms of access strategies, uh, Tetraves have opted to adopt a licensing approach whereby they license the other partners in these countries and this maximizes the jurisdictions with which the drug is made available. Um, with regards to stewardship, they've adopted more of a point of care uh, diagnostic approach whereby they provide hospitals with testing trips, testing strips, sorry, um, and this helps to check the susceptibility of the infection to the drug. And then with regards to bedequiline or Sutura, which is produced by Johnson & Johnson for multidrug resistant TB, um, the pediatric formulation, the access strategy is the same for that of the adult formulation, which basically involves a managed, managed access program through the global drug facilities. And with regards to stewardship, um, they opt for more of an educational activities, and this is targeting uh, pediatric clinical um, or healthcare professionals. Um, sticking with the theme of R&D, so to enrich R&D pipelines, um, valuable antibiotics, we need novel antibiotics with new modes of actions. Um, now, this offers the best choice for longevity of the antibiotic in question. Now, as you can see from the top uh, or from the 20 research and development based companies, now this involves both large uh, R&D based companies as well as the biopharmaceutical companies. Um, together, they develop nine novel candidates. Um, and it's important to note that six out of the nine are actually being developed by biopharmaceutical companies. Now, as I mentioned before, with regards to the antibiotic market, we are seeing that traditionally we have been seeing divestments by many players. However, this void or this gap seems to have been filled by the biopharmaceutical industry. Now, this kind of relates to the method of uh, funding which has been available. So in terms of the push and pull incentives, which we will touch on later. Um, now, it's important to note the novelty here. Uh, we adopted the WHO criteria, whereby it had to fulfill one of four criteria. So the first one, either it used to have a, a new chemical class. The second component is that it either needs to have aims at a new target or has a new mode of action, or finally, the absence of cross-resistance with other antibiotics. So in terms of um, antibiotic discharge, uh, we know that antibiotic discharge in waters produces a byproduct of the manufacturing and production process, has an impact on resistance. 
Um, 10 companies signed the industry roadmap, and through this, they commit themselves to establish science-driven targets for antibiotic discharge concentrations. Um, as you can see here, we have, through the analysis, we found eight companies that set discharge limits. However, none of these companies published the limits publicly. Um, now, it's imperative that transparency and disclosure of this information, as it's integral to allowing uh, governments, researchers, and other stakeholders to better understand the causal relationship between industrial discharge of active pharmaceutical ingredients and the environment, as well as the link that has to subsequent development of antimicrobial resistance. So as you can see here on the illustration on the right-hand side, as I said, all eight companies um, that set discharge limits. However, there is an issue there or there is a call for action surrounding transparency of this information. Um, this is just a synopsis slide with regards to how companies are performing in terms of their risk management strategy. Um, as you can see across the top, we here look at the breadth of how pharmaceutical companies adopt these strategies and whether it applies to just their own manufacturing sites or across the whole continuum or the whole uh, supply chain essentially. So as you can see, some of the more refined approaches whereby the actual risk management strategies applies to both the company's own manufacturing sites as well as third party manufacturers and external waste um, treatment plants. So moving on to the uh, issue of access, um, essentially to make a new antimicrobial medicine available to the people that need it, a company must first apply to register this medicine within the country's uh, regulatory authority. On approval, this medicine can then be subsequently sold. Now it's important to note why we put an emphasis on registration. As with this registration activity comes a whole cascade of activities that contributes to improving access to medicine. Now this is not limited to investments in um, building local distribution chains as well as improving health infrastructure, um, and finally, educating healthcare professionals and patients. Now this, in conjunction, helps to raise the overall or the average health literacy in these settings. Now, as you can see, um, almost 65% of the antibiotics are registered in countries where ac access is likely limited. Um, so of those 43 antibiotics, 15 were found to have been not registered. Of those, um, Augmentin or Comoxiclav, produced by GSK, was seen to be registered in the highest number of countries, and this amounted to 71 um, countries. So, um, it's important to note that actually when raising um, the issue of AMR, awareness is, is a key component to changing healthcare professionals' behavior on the misuse and overuse of antibiotics. Raising awareness is one of the, the primary um, components outlined in the UK AMR review. Um, the scale and geographic reach of many companies, um, especially the large research-based pharmaceutical companies, provides a major opportunity to, age, to, to educate a large number of healthcare professionals. Now, this essentially means prescribing the right drug at the right time, at the right dose, for the right duration. Now, this is important Then these educational activities must occur in a backdrop of strong governance systems, as well as strategies to mitigate conflict of interest. Um, now, below here, you can see some of the activities some of these pharmaceutical companies are doing. And essentially the educational programs that have been run rotate around three main topics. Now this includes AMR stewardship, uh, the rational use of antibiotics, and then disease specific education that's not linked to the product. Um, now as you can see of the 29 programs um, that carry out educational uh, programs, these have been run by a total of 18 companies in scope. Um, now companies often opt for, or we've been through the analysis, we can see that companies um, opt for more of a, an active learning approach. Now this involves courses, uh, trainings, and congresses. Um, however, through this analysis, it's also been emphasized that the link between marketing and education does appear blurred. Um, it's important to note that market-based approaches to educating healthcare professionals can compromise and undermine the value of um, these educational programs. So as I said, the appropriate use um, is key to conservation efforts and helps prolong the lifespan of antibiotics. Now the traditional pharmaceutical sales approach has been to remunerate cell staff on the volume of cells. This model essentially undermines any conservation efforts, especially when linked to irrational inappropriate use. Now through the analysis, we found four companies that are changing the way in which they remunerate cell staff and they remove the incentive or the volume based um, incentive which essentially removes the need to oversell antibiotics. Now, GSK and Shinogi adopt a, a full decoupling uh, approach. 
with other companies still testing the waters in terms of what it is they can do in terms of decoupling sales, um, of decoupling uh, remuneration uh, from sales volumes. Okay, so on the slide here, as I said, this is just more of a synopsis slide in terms of um, what companies are doing in terms of strengthening their promotional practices in relation to stewardship of antibiotics. Um, as you can see, on the left-hand side, we've got the commitments of the industry with regards to promotional, and then the activities which basically span from everything from how they reflect AMR trends in marketing materials through to, to how they incentivize sales staff in terms of sales of antibiotics. Okay, so it's widely acknowledged that the, um, the true extent and the burden of AMR is less well ca characterized in resource-limited settings. Um, exacerbating the issue of widespread resistance is the absence of local disease surveillance systems, which are integral to the monitoring efforts. Um, significant data limitations, such as consumption data, uh, resistance levels, transmission patterns in, in, in countries in scope, significantly undermine um, these efforts. Um, nine companies report running a total of 19 AMR surveillance programs across 147 countries. Um, now, it's important to note that it's important for these surveillance programs for there to be data harmonization. And we, we will call or advocate for more um, long-term monitoring programs versus ad hoc or um, point prevalence um, uh, surveillance programs. So of the eight companies, or of the, um, of the nine companies involved in surveillance, seven of those are large pharmaceutical companies. We also have one generic, uh, one generic company, as well as one biopharmaceutical company. Um, now it's important to note that actually within the public health sphere, there are global health initiatives, such as the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance System, or the GLASS, which is supported by WHO. And this essentially advocates for a standardized approach to the collection, analysis, and sharing of data at a global level. So it's, it's promising to see pharmaceutical companies contributing to surveillance efforts worldwide. Um, this is just a synopsis slide, um, which basically shows how and where the 30 companies in scope, um, evaluated by the benchmark, and how they disclose activities that address each of the 10 priorities where alignment exists. And what I mean by alignment here is between the UK AMR review, the AMR framework for action, which is published by the Interagency Coordination Group on AMR, and the Davos Declaration. As you can see from the schematic, R&D does get the most attention. However, pipelines are still small, and considering the attrition rates in the projects in R&D, um, we call for more incentives for that to be in terms of incentivizing more companies to get involved in R&D. Now, these are not limited to, but essentially kind of cover um, push incentives, which are widely um, in place as well as newly called for pull incentives. Now, push incentives basically reduce the cost function of R&D, whereas pull incentives um, help to give a, um, essentially an incentive to deliver the product to market. So these can be in the form of, for example, market entry rewards or financial um, prizes, if you like. Um, now, at the bottom of the schematic, you can see diagnostics in agriculture and animal health. It's important to note that these are not in scope for the benchmark. Um, they are reported on, but not, but not scored. Um, okay, so I've included this slide here because this is just in terms of the marketed, um, the companies in scope, um, we essentially looked at their marketed um, antibiotic or antimicrobial um, medicines. And we found that there are at least 741 antimicrobial products, half of which target bacterial infections. Now this by default may be skewed in that we chose the, the companies in scope due to their antibacterial pipelines. Now we know that resistance to different products acro vary across and, and, and are different across different products. And that already some of these products may, also, may already be deemed or may already be rendered uh, redundant due to resistance. Um, now you can see, for example, in terms of the antibacterials on the bottom right hand corner, beta lactams, which are your kind of broad spectrum antibiotics. And these are typically your go-to first line uh, antibiotics before the causative uh, organism is identified. Um, within the antiprotozoals of interest, for example, maybe the antimalarials, which is still endemic in many countries, even though there is global procurement systems in the way of the global fund, for example. And then antivirals, here we have stuff like uh, antiretrovirals for HIV uh, and antihepatitis, which you know is proving to be an issue in terms of access, both in resource-limited settings and high-income country markets. Um, 
Now, this is a, a graph that we've basically um, uh, made whereby we have mapped out the company's uh, portfolios to um, the newly or the, the latest iteration of the WHO's um, essential medicines list. So the, the last iteration of the EML or the essential medicines list essentially um, outlined antibiotics into key access, um, access and watch and reserve groups. Um, now you can see here, we've mapped the pharmaceutical company's portfolio to these separate groups. And essentially from this illustration, we will see that where companies have a larger proportion of their portfolio in the access groups, we would call for more refined access strategies. Now this involves registration in the highest number of countries possible, as well as um, adopting more of an equitable pricing strategy whereby they take socioeconomic factors into play, um, allowing them to differentiate the market in terms of prices. And then finally, um, getting involved in supply chain strengthening activities to ensure adequate supply. Um, on the right-hand side, whereby the companies have the largest proportion of antibiotics in the reserve group, we would expect these companies to have more of a refined stewardship approach. Now, this can touch on everything from um, having surveillance systems in place through to how they uh, remunerate sales staff and promotional activities. So this is just the a summary slide of what the different sections of the benchmark are. Um, as you can see, so the key findings is what I've just presented. As I said, I've kept this very high level because it is uh, the, the half an hour does not do the report justice. Um, we have then touched on three case studies whereby we've outlined examples for where we felt there is um, uh, an, an equal approach in terms of access and stewardship. The portfolio analysis is basically what we've just discussed in terms of where we're looking at the company's marketed antibiotics already on the market. And then finally, uh, there are the 30 company report cards. Now, within this presentation, I have not touched on those, but essentially, all the indicators are mentioned in terms of the research scopes. Within the company report cards, this essentially delves into an indicator by indicator uh, basis and looks at where companies can improve performance. Um, this also includes stuff like, for example, mapping the company's R&D pipelines. So just to sum up then, um, I've just included a couple of slides in terms of illustratively how these companies are performing. Now I'd like to stress that this is not a ranking. Um, and however, we do aim to benchmark companies within their respective groups. So within the large research-based pharmaceutical companies, um, GSK has the largest antimicrobial pipeline. Um, Johnson & Johnson adopts more of a focused approach whereby they predominantly target TB. With regards to the generic manufacturers, um, the, uh, Myelin and Cipla lead the bunch. And then from the 12 clinical stage biopharmaceutical companies, um, Entasis comes out with the overall strongest performance. Um, now here, as you can see, just in terms of the illustrations of how the companies have performed. Um, so this is for the large research-based pharmaceutical companies. As I said, you can see within the different domains, so the research and development, the manufacturing and production, and appropriate access and stewardship, and how they rank or how they perform within the individual um, uh, research domains. Now this is the same for generics and as well for biopharmaceutical companies. Note that the overall maximum score differs, so the gray bar, and this basically um, reinforces the fact that there's some areas where biopharmaceutical companies may not be operating. Therefore, the total uh, scores available to that company may differ. So this has been a very whirlwind um, uh, kind of run through of the, of the Access to Medicine Foundation's latest antimicrobial resistance benchmark. Um, and I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and as I said, I, I kind of urge you to either log onto our website or download the PDF as there are within the individual um, technical areas or research domains, there are some very, very interesting uh, pieces of analysis that we've carried out. So I do urge you to go and delve deeper into the report. Um, now if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to take. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing these insights with us, Karar. Um, we do have a few more minutes left, so again, it would be great. Um, we welcome your questions. Please feel free to use the chat function. Um, we're, all, we're happy to read out. Uh, we're happy to read aloud the uh, questions or to use the raise hand function to pose a live question. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, questions. We welcome questions and comments, reflections that anyone might have. We do have one question here um, regarding, from a, po a public policy perspective, are there any particular policies, whether it be regulatory or pricing and reimbursement in nature that has served to incentivize industry to adopt some of the best practices that um, have been highlighted in the report? Okay, that's quite an interesting one. 
Um, I mean, if we stick to the overarching um, kind of research domains, so for R&D, um, I would say obviously the, in terms of the incentive structure to rectify the market failures I touched on um, in terms of that. Um, put incentives in place. So as I said, um, push incentives are basically where it reduce the cost function of R&D. And this essentially aims to spread out the cost um, amongst different players. With regards to pull incentives, um, these are essentially incentives that reward the actual um, delivery of a, of a new antibiotic to the market. Now, currently, 70% of the funding um, is push funding. Now, this may um, be the reason as to why we have a significant representation of, of small and medium enterprises in the R&D space. So according to our analysis, um, I think there is about 40% of the R&D pipeline is attributed to uh, biotechnology companies or small and medium enterprises. Um, however, as the kind of public health uh, arena uh, of late has kind of suggested, there is a need for more pull incentives. Um, now with these pull incentives, hopefully these will kind of strive to shift products along the um, clinical pipeline, um, with, but as it essentially adopts a pay for performance. So. Um, you essentially get the, the financial reward, or as the UK AMR review suggests, um, they suggest a market entry reward of about, I think it's 1 billion. Um, and this is essentially delivered on delivery of a successful antibiotic. Now, why pull incentives may be important for the access and stewardship debate is that with the pull funding can come certain conditionalities surrounding access and stewardship. So this involves, for example, um, ensuring that there are plans in place to make this, uh, or to make this new agent as widely as possible within the, um, the, the kind of uh, component of ensuring that there are adequate stewardship activities in place. Um, other kind of uh, policy things I would suggest or would, that I, I think could be carried out is surrounding the, the pricing of antibiotics. Now, as I said, this is a highly generics market. Um, however, I would urge health systems to be cautious surrounding aggressive pricing strategies. Um, as a recent study, which basically looked at um, the 33 forgotten antibiotics. And essentially, um, this was done by uh, Polsini and colleague. And essentially, they outlined the economic motives were the major cause for the discontinuation of marketing of these antibiotics. So 14 of the 33 antibiotics they outlined um, had limited availability in a range of different jurisdictions. So basically, I would call for kind of health systems to adopt more of a, um, a nuanced approach regarding their procurement and pricing strategies. So for example, running tenders um, in terms of running short-term tenders. Um, and this essentially prevents stuff like the sunset clause whereby companies um, are essentially priced out of the market and are forced to give up uh, marketing authorization if they're not in the market for a number of years. Um, so these are just kind of some of the, the, the policy implications. But um, as I said, there, there is more and more of a convergence in terms of the public health um, uh, arena as well as the private sector in terms of investors and the pharmaceutical companies. Great. Uh, we have one other question. Our next question here is, uh, what are the impacts that the Access to Medicine Foundation expects to achieve or may have already achieved with this report? Okay. I mean, in terms of impact, as I said, this, we, obviously we acknowledge that the uh, companies operate very, very differently. Um, as I mentioned at the start, we do aim to identify best practice, and we hope that through the identification of these practices, um, this will stimulate all companies to either emulate what we consider as best practices. So whether this may be in terms of uh, R&D or in terms of manufacturing production with regards to the um, environment risk, environmental risk management strategies, or adopting, for example, a wide um, registration scope with regards to where they file for these uh, new antibiotics. And as I said, through hopefully dissemination of these best practices, we do aim that pharmaceutical companies, or we hope that pharmaceutical companies will both emulate these best practices and surpass them. Um, and as I said, with, with the way in which we run um, uh, our research, it is an iterative process. So we hopefully aim to continually raise the bar um, by finding alignment as to where these companies can continue to um, improve, that, improve the um, antimicrobial resistance um, issue. Great, thank you. So we have one last question um, here. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from uh, Luc Beaulieu from I know the um, INSS, I, INESSS from uh, Quebec in Canada. 
And he says, I'd like to know uh, what were your criteria for the surveillance program that you calculated across the different countries? In your slide, you, uh, in your slide where you are exposing it, you refer to zero, one to two, and three or more. I felt surprised by those numbers that I, I feel are lower than expected. Had this, had this data been collected, has these data been collected recently or a few years back? Um, so if I understand the question correctly, he's referring to the slide I'm showing now. Um, so the number of companies involved in I know. Is that right, Luke? Let me see if I can. Um, Yes, I think it was the previous slide that you were presenting before. This one here or no? The previous one with the map? This one here. Yes, I'll reread the question briefly. Uh, yes, with the map. So I'd like to know what were your criteria for the surveillance program that you calculated across the different countries? In your slide where you are exposing it, you refer to zero one to two and three or more. I felt surprised by those numbers that I feel are lower than expected. Have these data, uh, has this data been collected recently or a few years back? Okay, um, I mean, I'm assuming with the zero, it's basically where he says there are no surveillance programs. Um, as I said, with this, we are relying on companies on what they publicly disclose or what they disclose to the benchmark. Um, that's not to say whereby there is, um, there may be a whole host of surveillance programs for which they do not disclose. And it's important to note that there are obviously other companies that are not within the company's scope. Um, and again, these are in terms of the programs outlined in this map, these are ongoing surveillance programs. So there may be programs, for example, they were uh, running or had stopped before a period of analysis. Um, so again, these are purely programs that are disclosed to the companies in scope or disclosed by the companies in scope to the um, index. And these have, must have been running during the period for which we analyze um, our metrics. So um, I don't know if that provides a justification as to why the number um, the gentleman is referring to is lower than expected or not. Um, as I said, this is not to say that there may be more surveillance programs out there, but it's important to note that we do have a specific company scope. So um, of the 30 companies, Excellent. is what is disclosed to us. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you, Luke, for your question. Um, and to wrap up, uh, would you like to leave our audience with any key takeaway messages? Okay. I mean, the, essentially, the, the, as I said, with, with the, with, when considering the AMR debate, um, I'd just like the, uh, the audience just to consider that access is equally an important issue as um, resistance. And obviously, we call for the strength of the pipelines. Uh, we call for more transparency surrounding um, how companies adopt the way in which they uh, manufacture and produce antibiotics. Um, and as I said, in terms of uh, access, we do call for more of a consideration in terms of getting these antibiotics to the resource limited or the most disenfranchised populations worldwide. And this should hopefully aim to curb some of the um, colossal uh, mortality data that we're seeing uh, and it's disproportionately affecting these jurisdictions. So I think that's that's the uh, that's the gist of, of um, what I would would kind of call for today. So I said just more of a, um, an emphasis on the access issue as well as the um, the resistance, and that the two should occur in tandem. One cannot occur without the other. And that's all I'd like to wind up by saying. So I think we can end it there. Thank you very much to Karar for making the time to speak with us and a big thank you to all of you for joining. We'll be posting a recording of the webinar on our website, www.leadinghealthsystemsnetwork.org. And feel free to share your, this link with your colleagues. Uh, we also would like to invite you to attend our next webinar featuring Chief Medical Officer Dame Sally Davies, who will be speaking on the global response to AMR and future directions for stewardship later this month on the 23rd of April. Thank you again and hope you'll join us next time. Bye-bye.